folks that are listening and watching on our YouTube stream, welcome. You're right now uh, behind the curtain with us as we get ready to go live. Bear with us. Kara Akara, uh, jeez, I won't screw that up on the show, probably. It's okay. McNulty, right? Yep. Okay. Sarah missed that whole eighth grade girlfriend thing, so we'll cover that later. All right, we are going to go live in three. Sherry, just to warn you, your camera's on. <clears throat> Two and one. All right, welcome. Greetings, everyone. This is Eric Glazer. Welcome to our live recording of Bright Spots in Healthcare, produced by Shared Purpose Connect. We bring uh, leaders together to not only inform our audience, but also, most importantly, unearth bright spots, successes at health plans, hospitals, and various healthcare organizations. Our goal is to identify as many bright spots as possible so that you, the listener, can determine if these ideas shared on our show can be applied at your organization. We believe this approach of finding a bright spot and cloning it is the most effective strategy to improve healthcare in our lifetime. If you have yet to subscribe to Bright Spots in Healthcare on your favorite podcast app, please do so. And if you have already subscribed, we ask you the favor of rating it with five stars and make, making a nice comment on it. This does help us uh, come up easier in the search engines, especially those podcast searches. So we uh, thank you in advance if you could take the effort to do that. Today's topic is near and dear to my heart and one which many of you listening could probably relate to in one way or another. It's entitled Supporting the Silent Sufferers, Simplifying Mental Health and the Patient Experience. And we have two very special guests to address the topic. Karak McNulty, who's the president of Aetna Behavioral Health, and Sarah Ratner, the senior vice president at Revel Health. To save time today, we've emailed you their impressive bios, and we've posted them on our website, sharedpurposeconnect.com. We'll also post them in the chat so you can get a sense of the incredible knowledge and insights you are about to tap into. We are able to provide you all of our programming each and every week through the incredible support that you all provide us now, we know we don't charge you to listen, to watch, to log in, but because you're coming to these shows and more of you are coming each and every month, we're able to handpick specific organizations who both support our episodes, but also add to the robustness of our discussions. So I want to shout, make a shout out and thank you to Revel Health, one of our awesome partners and sponsors of the Bright Spots in Healthcare podcast. You have heard me pontificate before, if you're a regular here, that we tend to have a really big echo chamber in healthcare. And we need to sometimes look outside of our own lane when thinking about things like consumer engagement. I prefer to, uh, and I think when you think about Revel Health and what they do and how they're supporting our program, they do things much differently than most of us in healthcare. If you've not heard from Sarah Ratner before, you're missing out because besides being one of the most frequent guests on Bright Spots in Healthcare, she's one of the most thoughtful and smart healthcare strategists you will meet. And today, alongside Cara, she will provide, they will provide you great insights and provoke all kinds of thinking and how to engage sufferers of mental health elements. Now, Sarah, that mention around Revel Health is a little outdated at this point. And uh, the, although the message about your unique capabilities and how you go about things is not, but we do have some breaking news. And so I want to sort of break, uh, break out of script here and ask you to jump in and maybe provide uh, our listeners uh, some insights to this breaking news. Uh, sure. Thanks, Eric. So about an hour ago, we announced to the market that uh, Revel Health and Nobu Health are merging. Um, which is really exciting because Nobu Health, we're gonna bring Nobu Health's best in class healthcare loyalty programs combined with Revel Health's breakthrough applied behavioral research and healthcare actions technologies. We're gonna bring them both together. So we'll have an unparalleled, para, unparalleled ability to deliver this personalized multi-channel communication at scale across healthcare. So it's very exciting. 
and uh, late breaking news today. Super exciting. I don't know how many times we get to break news on the show. So I've uh, checked out the press release, uh, both at uh, novuhealth.com and rebel-health.com. Uh, the press releases are front and center. Uh, actually, it's novu.com. I apologize, N-O-V-U.com. And you can check out the press releases there. All right, uh, we're going to get to it, ladies. Uh, for those listening, quick uh, PSA. If you want to ask these two esteemed experts questions throughout the show, you can do so by clicking on the Q&A module in the bottom right of your Zoom interface. And uh, Sherry Kills, our producer and and I will uh, be monitoring that and we'll integrate those questions into the flow of the conversation. My only uh, ask is to not use the chat to ask your questions. We have a lot of people listening live right now. It's much easier for us to manage the questions coming in by way of the Q&A module, not the chat. And for those of you who submitted questions upon registering, we have them in the queue already and we'll try to integrate some of those into the conversation as well. So. Here we go. Uh, Sarah, let's start with you and let's sort of just set the stage, level set, if you will. What is a silent sufferer? So today um, we're seeing a lot of people go about their lives. They appear happy, um, maybe a little bit stressed, irritable. Um, but a lot of these people who appear happy have a mental health condition. So many people feel that um, there is a low perceived need for help. Like this is a way of life. So I don't have a mental health condition. I'm just kind of suffering through the daily trials and tribulations of life. Um, a lot of people think they can deal with this on their own. Um, and there's also historically been this stigma of, gosh, if I speak out, I'm gonna be labeled or stigmatized in a way that I really don't want to right now. Um, other things are people don't have the money or ability to access care and, and about 50% of people cite cost as a reason for not getting care. And so these people who stay in the shadows and don't have the ability to be able to access care or get the treatment and services that they need are truly the silent sufferers. And we're seeing many more today than ever. So on the business side of things, you know, Cara, why is it so important for health plans and health systems to recognize silent sufferers? Yeah, you know, Eric, it's great to be here and, and thank you for the question and cheers to Novu and Revel for your big announcement. Great companies coming together. You know, when we think about silent sufferers, Sarah is so spot on. I mean, if you just look at what's happening in the pandemic, CDC just did a study that looked at adults and, you know, 10% of adults feel that their mental health has been impacted by the pandemic alone. And yet, as Sarah talked about, many people don't get the, the support or care they need. And there's a lot of reasons. And we as health plans and healthcare providers and provider systems play a really important role in one, reducing the stigma, two, ensuring access to care and really democratizing access. So everybody has access to care. And three, making sure that care is the right care at the right time where we do not have barriers such as price or provider availability or um, our own community get in the way of us seeking support. And, you know, those silent sufferers prior to the pandemic was an issue with this pandemic. We as a community, it's going to take more than just healthcare we as a community and an ecosystem need to look at how we recognize, understand and support people because we all have mental health needs and issues and ability to improve. So um, a big role that we can play as part of that community in healthcare. Yeah, totally agree. Well said. Sarah, from your perspective, 
how are you seeing first, you know, the importance of these business of the businesses, health plans and provider systems, identifying and recognizing the, the silent sufferers and, and what are you seeing out there uh, in, in the industry as you get to see multiple different businesses? Yeah, so this is so impactful to businesses right now. I mean, obviously healthcare is dealing with it front and center, but all of our employers and government agencies are trying to wrestle with this right now, um, primarily because depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide. So at a very basic level, we've got to deal with this because we're creating more and more um, disability challenges by not. We also know that untreated mental health costs our country $300 billion a year in loss and productivity. And this is the most expensive category of healthcare costs. So just at a financial level, it is so critical that businesses focus on this. And also it is, you know, Cara, to your point, it's a social imperative that we deal with this right now because we are in a time where it, there is no more important thing to do right now than to support engaging in and getting the resources for mental health because we all become more productive and lead healthier lives and can be there for our family and support one another through this terrible time. Sarah, how do you, and when, when you take someone who you've identified, how do you get them, you know, Cara mentioned, uh, identify the person at the right time and get them the right care? How, how do you do that? Yeah, so you, you can't call somebody and say, are you depressed? That's a big hurdle for people to overcome, to say, yes, I'm depressed, because most of the time they don't realize that they're depressed. As we just discussed, they're a silent sufferer and they think it's just, they've got to deal with it. Um, so you have to get them to engage in a way that's very um, non-invasive and doesn't even suggest that there is a behavioral health issue. So for example, when we um, send out a health risk assessment or some type of survey around engagement, one of the questions we ask is, how are you sleeping? That is a leading indicator that there is a problem. So we know that that can help direct people to the right resources immediately to take that action. So truly it's all in the way that you ask the questions and layer on to it compassion because people don't want to answer this question if they feel that who they're engaging with is not compassionate around the subject. Yeah, I wanna get a little bit more into tactics on, on executing on that in a moment. Uh, Cara, I've got a question for you and also uh, one of our guests has a question for you. So I'm gonna combine them in two. Uh, how do you overcome when you're looking at the multiple barriers around the consumer experience and providing uh, a seamless experience? How do you do that? And then the follow-up question from one of our uh, attendees, uh, thank you, Colleen O'Brien, is do we have the, the access and capacity to address some of these needs? Great, great question. So I think most of us would agree that the healthcare system, specifically when it pertains to mental health, is challenging to navigate, can be confusing. We expect people to know that what they're feeling can be treated and what it is and who they should see. And even if you just look at the number of providers we have, the, the number of times I'm talking with people and they're like, I, I don't know, do I see a social worker or a psychologist or a psychiatrist? So, you know, at CVS Health Aetna, what we are doing is we are focusing and continually focusing on putting the member and their ecosystem at the center of the equation. Because as any of us know, it's not just the person who is handling a mental health issue, it's also, also those that are surrounding them. And so we focus on that ecosystem and that ecosystem might be their family. It might be their religious community. It might be, you know, who, who are your people? So we keep those at the center. And what we're doing is taking specific strategies around policy systems and environmental change that really impact that member, that individual experience. 
So for example, like Sarah talked about, you know, super important. You don't just say to someone, are you depressed? You have to look at what is it that is tripping people up? And it might come out through sleep. It might come out because they have a financial crisis. It might be that they are um, withdrawing. So we look at ways to capture that information, whether it's through a health assessment or, you know, you might be calling because you are, um, you lost your medical card and we are engaging in short surveys that help assess someone's mental health well-being. And that is so we can help get people to the right place at the right time. The other thing we're doing is we're not expecting people to know what they don't know. And, you know, so we don't have to wait for people to have an issue. We know that if you have a new diagnosis, let's say of a chronic condition, it is highly likely you're going to experience stress or anxiety. So we couple all of our care with mental health resources. We know that if you're pregnant or choosing to think about getting pregnant, there is there can be stress and anxiety or you know, postpartum anxiety, et cetera. So we couple information. And then the last thing I would say is we make sure that we are removing those barriers so that you can get the care and support you need without having to know like, what's going on with me and we make it okay because when people don't seek care that's when we have issues that continue to exacerbate so that's that's question one question two do we have the right providers or the people to to care for our communities the reality is we do have a shortage in mental health providers in specific expertise so psychiatry, adolescent psychiatry. But one of the things we can do to mitigate that, that gap is ensure that people get to the right provider. Because often people get to the wrong provider and what they really needed was a psychologist, but we expect the patient or individual to know. So one of the things we do really well is help people navigate to get to that right provider. But we still across the board, we have to encourage people to go into the field of mental health, whether it's in social work or psychology or psychiatry, because we do have a gap in our provider system. Yeah, so uh, just uh, Sarah, Carr, I'm gonna rearrange a couple of these questions here because I think uh, I wanna go down this route. So Carr, I'm gonna keep you on, on the hot seat for a moment. Uh, so the navigation stuff's near and dear to my heart. Uh, some of our regulars have heard me speak publicly about some of the uh, challenges uh, my wife and I have faced in helping uh, our daughters with certain conditions and finding the right therapeutic alliance and the right care and even knowing where to go. Could you speak more specifically to how you go about that navigation? And then uh, the quick follow-up to that would be can you maybe provide a real example of a program that CVS Aetna is, is providing access, how you're providing access and opportunity to those? So two parts again. Yeah, no problem. Absolutely. So let's, um, let's start with one of the things we did right at the start of the pandemic. And, you know, we provide coverage to millions of people across the country. But we know as a company, as Sarah talked about, what is most important is people have the resources and ability to get the care they need. And whether you have our insurance or not, we are concerned about our population's health and population meaning everyone, whether they're under our insurance or not. So we did something, we have a, a service called Resources for Living. And Resources for Living is real-time confidential counseling and support that addresses not only mental health concerns, but social determinants. And we offer this service to 25 million people across the country. When the pandemic hit, we opened up that line for anyone across the country, whether you had our insurance or not. 
And what we do with that line is you can call in and you can say, you know what, I am really concerned because I'm a, an essential worker and I'm worried about I'm worried about getting sick and bringing that home to my family. Can you help me deal with, let's say, you know, you have anxiety, anxiety. You might say I've been furloughed and I'm really worried. And I live in Texas. I'm really worried about how I'm going to pay my rent and what I'm going to do about childcare to get another job. Resources for living will help look in your area. Where are there resources for you available in your community to help you with your issue? Because we don't assume that you're going to call and say, I have a mental health concern. What we assume is something is tripping you up and we're going to help you from a mental, physical, emotional support system. So we opened that lineup. We have handled thousands and thousands of calls, helping people get the support they need, including counseling and mental health services. So that's something we've done and will continue to do. We also, Eric, as our members specifically, we help them navigate by having specific concierge programs that help them navigate the system, that um, we do assessments that are built into all of our care management programs that are built in the system. So you don't have to say, I think I'm depressed. We're, we're looking at data. We're working with you to say, gosh, you know what? Here's what we're seeing. Let us help you. We're helping you navigate instead of you saying, I think something's wrong. So we're coming at it both ways. I think I answered both of your questions, but. So I have that, I'm an Aetna member. So I have access to that service most likely. You do. Cool. Look at look at the benefits I'm getting from just hosting the show. Uh, th thank you for that. So, Sarah, can we talk about you know a lot of uh, inherently pre-COVID a lot of the challenges that we we saw sort of in populations around silent sufferers were some of the lower income, um, Medicaid and, and the uninsured, and I think as we are experiencing this pandemic. We're seeing obviously uh, definitely a, um, a, a divide as far as folks in areas uh, of lower income are definitely suffering even more. How are you helping identify and engage these silent sufferers in those populations? And did you take a different approach? Yeah, so um, th this is a very interesting time because there are people who are uh, you know, kind of popping out of the woodwork who you never would expect to have an issue. And the way they need to address it is very, very different than somebody else who's even similarly situated. And so what we're trying to do is to identify anybody who could potentially have an issue. And as we start to work with them and get them to answer questions and talk a bit about you know, their, their circumstances. Um, we need to, in concert with that, provide immediate solutions. Um, people can't wait. Like Cara said, we can't have somebody call in and then say, okay, 14, you'll get an appointment in 14 weeks. It's like, no, that's too late. Somebody could commit suicide. They could be hospitalized. Um, they could just have a nervous breakdown. And so people need to get that resource immediately. And what we're trying to do is when people are activated, when they're answering these questions, that signal that somebody does have a emotional mental health issue to really trigger them at that point to say, okay, let's get you over to that resource, whether it's resources for living or some other type of way to get them the help. And if we can do that in a way that is highly personalized, where we know we can get them to respond, then that actually increases the likelihood that they're going to engage. So for example, I may say um, to uh, a grandmother, you really need to get help because um, you're suffering. Well, that may not resonate with her. What may resonate is your grandkids and your kids need you during this period of time. 
And so we would like to provide you a resource that can help you with this. That resonates. And we know that through a lot of the field work that we've done and the research to help understand the triggers and get that immediate engagement. And at that point, we have a greater likelihood that that person will start to get on this trajectory of getting the help and the care that they need. Sarah, if you were going to uh, advise our listeners on some of the best approaches to uh, abstracting or uh, grabbing that information and then so that you could do something with it. You need the data so that you could do something with it. Do you have some sort of suggestions on how to get started? Sure. Um, I mean, the most, the most basic way, but one of the most effective is when you, your existing populations or for new populations to send out a very simple health risk assessment or a survey, social determinants of health survey, to start to understand the factors and the variabilities that influence the different health conditions of your population. So that's absolutely critical. And is then- that, is, that a, uh, is that similar to the field guide we were talking about off, off camera yep. part of the show? Yep, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, can, can we, um, since we're on it, can we get that to folks if they want it? Is that, is that publicly available? Absolutely, we can we can make it available. Sherry, why don't we uh, why don't we ask folks who are on the call now if they want to look at this field guide? I'm going to continue on with Sarah's answer to this question. I don't I know she's got more to say here, but if people want a copy of that field guide, we're going to put up a quick poll right now, and anyone that wants won't, presses yes. You don't have to. We'll get you one personally. We'll get you a link to it or the PDF. We'll work with Revel to get you that. Revel Novu. So uh, keep on going. So you you, you mentioned the questions. And yeah, I so you, you, you get the, the basic questions, but you need to layer over that data that gives you more insights into that population. Um, an example I would give is there's, there's two block difference in Louisiana, in a, in a particular area of Louisiana. And we know there is a 40% difference in internet coverage. So am I going to tell somebody who has low internet coverage to use a digital resource? Probably not. I need to direct them to the right resource that's going to match their ability to be able to engage. So those different factors um, that are completely outside of healthcare really help um, influence the way that you get people to engage in these types of health actions. Hey, Eric, can I add to that? Yeah. You know, Sarah brought up a super great point, and that is if we want to improve the outcomes for people's mental health, we have to treat people holistically, so their physical and mental health together. We also, though, have to look at the modalities that best fit the needs of the population, and that modality might be a digital resource, but it it might not. And so really leveraging digital, video, um, bricks and mortar, face-to-face, -face, you know, just because we are social distancing right now doesn't mean that there aren't ways to still engage in group therapy and individual therapy. Um, but we have to address the modalities and not assume that, you know, everybody wants to receive information or get support the same way. So thank you, Sarah, for bringing that up. Really I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you said that. It's so true. And I could tell you again, going back to my personal experience, it's not just the modality of the um, delivery, digital in real life, what are, or in, in a bricks and mortar. It's also the modality of, of treatment, right? right. Could be not, CBT is not for everyone. Uh, certain medications are not for everyone. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really important. I, I, I want to take on that, Cara. There's uh, a question in the Q&A module that seems to be on point from a guy named Don that someone may know that uh, says, what data and tools are being used by CVS Aetna to identify or name a patient's sort of ecosystem and maybe provide an example of how you're doing so to change the care, care delivery? Yeah, that's the great question. So when we engage with a member, 
or if someone calls into resources for living and let's say they're not an Aetna covered member, we're asking them about, you know, are they calling about themselves or someone else? Who is their support system? And um, is their support system someone they want involved right now? Do they have a support system? And as we're working through the issues, asking questions to ensure that we're getting that support system what they need as well. So for example, parents might call in or a parent might call in about an adolescent teenage issue. That parent, they, they need support, but if there's other siblings in the home, that sibling may need support as well as the teenager they're calling about. So we, we assess that situation in an ongoing basis. Now, not everybody wants their ecosystem involved. So that's one way we do it. The other way is we do a lot of marketing to talk about mental health as a more than an individual um, opportunity or issue. So, you know, we know health is contiguous. My health well being affects that of my family, which affects that of the community. And so we talk about it that way as we're caring for people because we, we want to demystify that there's something wrong with not only the individual getting support, but the family getting support or the loved ones getting support. So we work really hard to engage the ecosystem because we know when you do, you have better outcomes for the individual and that family. Totally love it. Uh, since we're on ecosystem and, uh, you know, and we're going to start mentioning, I know the term social determinants very soon. Uh, Sarah, could you talk a little bit? I, I knew we brought up this field guide. A lot of people just requested it. And that helps sort of think about, you know, the customer design and how you're talking to people, whether you're talking to them, you know, in their home or somewhere else and all the things that someone who's collecting that data needs to be thinking about. Uh, just extending Kara's thought, how are you seeing, or what's the best way to go about creating a seamless frictionless onboarding process for someone that you may identify as a silent sufferer and you need to kind of move into the system in a way that's, that's sort of easy. And I know you gave an example to me when we were prepping for this around Sue, and I'm wondering maybe if you could provide that as illustration for everyone. Yeah, so that, that frictionless way is really taking um, the person into account and how they're situationally oriented. So the, the example that we spoke about it is Sue, 45 year old mother of three, um, stay at home, she's got, um, you know, two part-time jobs, but is trying to stay at home. She makes minimum wage, is on food stamps. Um, so if she was going to, for example, start to run, would you say, go get on a treadmill? She'd never run before. Probably not. You, you would counsel her into, okay, start walking short lengths, you know, 10 minutes outside here and there. Um, you're not gonna say go to a gym and get on a treadmill. That's too daunting. Same thing in mental health. You don't tell somebody, oh, hey, go see a psychologist. Um, you need to navigate them slowly into the process to be able to get them to almost self-actualize that they need the help. They can't be told it, they need to know it or it's not going to be effective. So when somebody actually does say, hey, yeah, I think I need some help. I'm really stressed, I'm struggling financially. At that point, you need the immediate resources. And this is why I love so much what, what Cara and her team are doing is because it surfaces at that point in time where there's an issue probably pre-crisis, because most of these can lead to crisis, and you're getting that um, kind of, you're getting that program or service before there's a problem, which 
I mean, that, that's what we need. And, and this system is predicated, has been predicated on, okay, we're gonna treat you when there's a mental health issue or crisis. But I think, you know, some of what Cara is doing is thinking about, well, how do you reflect on this in a way that's more even preventative? We've, we've got a massive structure around preventive health. So it's physical health. Why would we not have something similar for mental health? And so I really, really like this, this way of thinking where you're getting that um, interference and um, helping somebody immediately versus letting it prolong and saying, we're just gonna let it go until it's in crisis mode. Cara, I have a couple of questions that are related uh, that maybe you could address uh, around integrating primary care and behavioral health. Incidentally, folks, mark your calendar for next week, October 8th. We're covering how to embed mental health into primary care. I believe that's at 12 o'clock. I may be wrong about that. Maybe Sherry, you could post the time in the chat. I probably that's next week. But Cara, can you talk about the rationalization for integrating the practices of the two and, and how important that is? And I don't know if you have any examples of, of programs like that that are working well within your world, but if you have them, that would be great to hear. Sure. So, you know, we know that oftentimes primary care providers are the resource that is diagnosing someone with, you know, anxiety or depression and even, even setting up their medication. And primary care providers are fantastic in our healthcare system and they're taxed. I mean, they are busy, they don't have extra time. We also know that when you couple a primary care visit and let's say there's an assessment done by that primary care provider, maybe a PHQ-9 assessment and someone is um, needing to be treated for depression. When that primary care provider can give a resource for a licensed social worker to do therapy with that individual, we know we improve their outcomes. We know they're likely to stay on their medication, they have better recovery, and they have better long-term outcomes. But we often don't set up primary care providers with the known resources of hey, where should I send this person? We already expect primary care providers to do so much. So one of the things that we're doing at CVS Health Aetna is through our um, health hubs, which think of, a, think of a CVS store, but devoted to health and well-being. And in that health hub is a minute clinic. So a primary care clinic. We are piloting mental health services. And in that health hub and minute clinic pilot, what we are doing is whether you come in to see a minute clinic provider, whether you're getting a prescription filled, whether you're coming in to meet with a health concierge, we have a licensed social worker trained and on staff that can coordinate care for any mental health issues. So let's say the um, primary care provider or the nurse practitioner in the minute clinic diagnosed the person as having anxiety. We offer a licensed social worker to meet with that person and set up therapy sessions because we know it works out better for that individual. That individual can say no, but what we see is when we connect primary care and therapy we are driving better care utilization, reducing medical expenditure and getting better results. So with this pilot we're doing, we are also creating um, partnerships, PCP specific partnerships around these health hubs and minute clinics where we can do bi-directional um, navigation. So the PCP can navigate to the health hub the health hub can navigate back to the PCP or the specialist in that PCP. So let's say you need access to an adolescent psychiatrist. We're creating these relationships. So think of it as a um, community support for navigating and meeting people where they're at on this mental health journey. 
And when we do that, we set up PCP providers for success because we want people to see their PCP. We want PCPs to have the access and resources to other modalities, but we have to make it easy for that PCP to know exactly where to send people. I, I, Eric, I, I would also add that, I mean, the innovation is so necessary these days. We've, we've gotten into this really prescribed model that has not worked. Um, and so this is really um, demonstrating a shift. One of the things that um, there was a comment that mentioned, you know, primary care physicians are already just taxed. And so um, what we're seeing in this space is there is a lot of innovation thinking about how do you create value-based arrangements mm -hmm. where the provider is incented to spend the time and gets reimbursed for that, almost, a, you know, like a, a, a dyad approach, um, but, you know, remotely. Um, and so while we think about the shift in the system, the payment structure really needs to follow in order to ensure that care is managed in a holistic way. And I think CVS is, is demonstrating you know, the, the real way to innovate and hopefully other, other organizations will think about these value-based arrangements to help influence you know, the care that the, the patients need. I want to, a uh, couple of things. I, I want to get back in you. There's a bunch of questions that I have and are coming through the module uh, that they're sort of going back a little bit in our discussion, but maybe asking us to provide some more detail. One of the things, Car, I'd like to do is, you know, getting back to resources for a living, which is a, um, which is one of the bright spots I've, I've written down here that's come up today. I, I'd love for you to provide of an example of it in action. Uh, sure. I know when we spoke earlier, preparing for this, you were talking about that uh, frontline worker from Atlanta. Maybe you could provide that story so that folks could really tangibilize resources for a living in action. Sure. So um, this is a, I'll give an example of a 43 year old female, not covered by an insurance, doesn't have insurance, um, black, lives in Atlanta and is a frontline essential worker, uh, works in a retail facility and is experiencing a, a lot of stress and anxiety. One, worried about her single mother, worried about going to work and bringing home you know, COVID-19 to her teenagers. Two, worried about social unrest in her community. She has a friend who um, she confides in. That friend says, listen, I know of this resource. It's called Resources for a Living. She says, I don't want to call because you're going to have to have insurance and it's going to, I'm going to have to go through a bunch of different things and jump through hoops. And their friend says, I, I hear it's good. This friend, you know, what a blessing for friends because the friend's like, you just got to call. So this woman calls and gets one of our clinicians and our clinician empathetically just talks to her about, so what's happening? And she's, you know, she said, I'm really, I'm really worried because I'm a frontline worker and I think I could get furloughed and I don't know how I would pay my rent. And I have teenagers and I'm worried about bringing this home to them. And gosh, there's all this happening in my community. So there's a lot there. There's a lot. And as Sarah talked about, you know, it's not that you're just going to say, okay, hey, it sounds like you have anxiety. We need to do X, Y, and Z. It's listening. It's empathetically listening. And then it's helping, helping to look at, okay, what are the biggest barriers for this individual right now? So the clinician and this caller broke it down, looked at what she was most concerned about, looked at the resources in her community. So what happens if she does get furloughed? What could she do? What resources are available? How could she see she decided she wanted to talk to someone about her anxiety because it was causing her, one of the questions we asked was, how's your sleep? Not to be able to sleep. She's been irritable. She's nervous. This woman ended up continuing. So did this assessment with our clinician got resources in her community and started seeing a clinician in her local community. 
And even though it was a virtual visit, when the pandemic is done or when she's ready, she could see that clinician um, face to face and got support for her financial concerns all within her community. Now, that is how we remove barriers instead of just looking at, okay, we're going to deal with you just on this issue. It's looking at the individual holistically. And again, this, this individual isn't covered by Aetna and it doesn't matter. We believe that if we're going to help people on their path to better health, that you help people collectively. And so that's the type of support resources for living can provide. A lot of the calls we get are really around your basic needs. I'm worried about childcare. I, I am having some legal issues because I'm behind on my rent. I'm, and we help you navigate those in your own community, but then also look at, are there other things that are exacerbating these issues? So it's not a, okay, we just got that solved. It's helping the individual really get and uncover what's tripping them up. Great, great stuff. Uh, so I'm gonna, I wanna transition. We got a couple, 15 minutes left. I know we have a ton to cover. I wanna get into some innovations around engaging the Medicaid population. So I'm gonna go with you on that. Then I wanna get into, for both of you, financial impact. Uh, and if we have time, there's a couple of other questions I have. So far, by the way, I'm just running down all these bright spots. I'm categorizing them sort of in the three buckets, sort of the strong navigation and having a navigation program in place is something that it seems imperative. I, I as a consumer could, could speak to that. Uh, the resources for living program is, is certainly sounds like a really good bright spot. We'll talk about how to finance that in a moment, maybe. And then obviously asking the right questions and having the right field guide, which is something we're actually going to have be able to deliver to you. Thanks to the folks at Revel. Uh, those are some of the things I have. If I've missed stuff, uh, I invite you both to, to chime in. Uh, I do want to just take a quick moment again to uh, to thank Revel Novu. Tell me if I'm doing that right now, Sarah. Uh, I just, I know they're a perfect fit for topics like this. They work on behalf of, as you know, health plans and ACOs to take a really sophisticated approach to addressing an individual's needs. They often call it an individualized approach to population health. Uh, if you ever have been exposed to or work with any of the most sophisticated, successful consumer marketers, the agencies on Madison Avenue that like represent top brands that we all are associated with like Toyota and Apple and we could go on and on. The thing that Revel does is what these agencies do. Those agencies to drive our, to drive our buying behavior, they, they take a very sophisticated approach in identifying us and understanding our values well enough to truly influence our own behavioral change. And traditionally in healthcare, we haven't been that sophisticated in engaging and marketing to our consumers, our patients who are at the highest risk of costing the most money. And I, it's until now because Revel and Ovu are, are doing it differently, uh, very similar to some of the most sophisticated uh, marketers in the consumer space. So if you want to learn more, you could check them out at revel-health.com or now Novu, N-O-V-U.com uh, to check them out, see a lot of what they're doing. Because uh, I do believe they're one of the new, the latest uh, bright spots in healthcare today. So I just want to thank them again for supporting these programs. In fact, uh, I've gotten to know a lot of them very well through our working together. If you want to meet them or at least pick their brains about some of this stuff, uh, Sherry, why don't we put another uh, poll up? If you want to like talk to Sarah or some of her colleagues about some of the things you're thinking about, uh, even like get some free advice. Uh, I can make a personal introduction through email and, and get you in touch with these folks uh, without uh, any friction. So we'll put up a poll, uh, no obligation, but if you do want an introduction from me to the Revel team and Sarah, I'm happy to make it and we'll put that up there if, uh, and, and I'll follow up with that in the next 24 or 36 hours and get that done. All right, so let's talk now about Medicaid and some of the innovations around engaging those populations Sarah, If you had some ideas, there's a question from an audience member on you know, what are some innovations around engaging the Medicaid population? Yeah, so so if we take a step back, um, th there's many different um, makeups of people who are Medicaid beneficiaries. You've got kind of the, the moms and kids, um, and then you have the duals. 
So the duals have a great structure around them for the most part. They've got a lot of coordination of care, resources, dollars that plans can spend on them. So that, that's an easier population in certain respects to engage just because there's the resources to, to support it. I think for the, for the um, you know, kind of more moms and, and babies, moms and kids portion of the population, that can be very difficult. Oddly, um, Medicaid offers a very comprehensive mental health benefit. Um, they have lower out-of-pocket costs um, and just, just coverage can be better. Network is smaller and the access is the absolute hardest thing. So when you're thinking about a population like this, you know, to what Cara spoke to, it's really, it's not the mental health service, it's how do you eliminate all of these other barriers to um, accessing that resource? For example, if, if we're surfacing um, a referral to somebody who lives in the inner city, but we know based on demographic statistics that um, that area is highly concentrated with people who use public transportation. Well, are we gonna refer her to resources that are across town because she may have two kids, three jobs and probably not the time to, to do that? No, we're not. And so the innovation comes in how you layer the access to the resources with a lot of this external data in order to create a very individualized profile to drive that action. And without that, you're gonna create a peanut butter approach where you're like, okay, let's throw paper at you know, a million lives and we'll see if they go to a, a mental health provider. Well, we know from history that does not work. And unless you use this type of approach, success is very limited. And, and we know that from, from our data, from you know, plans that have been, that have come to us with success rates in like the 20%, driving engagement all the way up to 80%, um, which is unheard of in this, this space. But that personalized approach and that infrastructure, recognizing the infrastructure needs is absolutely critical to helping, especially the Medicaid population. And, and as far as these programs, Cara, in especially, you know, Resources for Living or any other programs around navigation. I mean, how are you measuring the financial impact of these, and and does it justify the investment in some of these programs, or are you just doing it because it's the right thing to do, or both? Uh, both. Okay. So you know, if you look at the origin of our company, it it is healthcare, and it is to help people on their path. And to not only help them on their path, but to have better healthcare outcomes. So inherently, that's just part of the fabric of our culture. And we're business. And if you look at population health, and you look at, in the most basic terms, what trips people up, unless we address, you know, some of those basic needs and those social determinants you often don't get to the health outcomes you're driving towards. So it makes better financial sense for us as a business to do this, but to provide this for plant sponsors, because you, we can, as Sarah talked about, we're working from a prevention standpoint, an intervention, and an acute care standpoint. So if you don't, then you're only working on situations after the fact. So. It is, it is the right thing to do. It is financially good for communities, for individuals and for business. And it really gets at solving and helping to solve the problems holistically, mentally, physically, and not just what is the issue du jour. So it impacts you know, us greatly. And the last thing I would say is, you know, Sarah talked earlier about the impact on business, mental health and impact on business. You know, what is more important to a business than their human capital? And your human capital, your humans 
we have to have those humans working at the top of their ability. And if we want people to be their best, we have to address their mental health in a way that takes the stigma out of it. So, so I heard a really interesting statistic quickly. So for every $1 invested in prevention and early intervention for mental health um, and addiction, it yields two to $10 in healthcare costs um, and productivity savings. So I think that the data, besides that it's the right thing to do, the data speaks for itself. Absolutely, Sarah, I, I can confirm that, you know, it depends on severity that the $2 to 10, but you get it back in spades. Yeah. You, you get this back in spades. You also are meeting people then along the journey. And Eric, if there's a bright spot, that is the bright spot is that we as healthcare and education and community can change the trajectory of mental health. We don't have to continue to have suicide, you know, at its peak next year when we talk, or, you know, we can, we can change this journey. We have the capabilities. You know, uh, it struck me as you were talking, uh, one of the most progressive uh, employers around this topic is Bell Canada. So if those of you check out, I think they call their program, Let's Talk. I think it's let's talk .bell, maybe .ca. Uh, they do a lot of innovative things around this and are speaking sort of our language as you're hearing the rhetoric today. Uh, they're speaking that same game. If you want to see an example of an employer who's investing a lot of resources, and there's obviously going to be an ROI there. So you could check them out. I, I want to, in the in limited time we have left, first of all, you would have received by now, everyone listening uh, live, uh, an email but from me again. Uh, congratulations, uh, asking for your feedback about today's session, but most importantly, what we should be covering in the future. All of our programming is determined by you in a sort of democratic manner. So you help us provide you with valuable programming. So uh, help me help you uh, as the movie goes and uh, take that survey and it'll save you additional emails from me, which is always, of course, uh, welcomed, I know. Uh, can we talk about racial disparity very quickly? And I know it's not a quick topic, uh, but, you know, Cara, how are you looking at it in, in mental health and how, what are you doing to address it? Uh, is it resources for living? Do you have other programs in place to help bridge that racial disparity? And then I'll turn it over to you, Sarah, to close it out. Yeah, it's a super important topic. So we as a business are working really hard to decrease the disparity. Recently, we have, we have committed to investing $600 million in communities we serve and work and live and play to close that racial gap in healthcare inequity. We um, do a lot of work with specific black and brown populations and communities to ensure they have access to appropriate care, whether that's physical or mental health. We are um, expanding services we provide that specifically address black and brown communities regarding mental health. And with resources for living, we, we not only focus on racial inequity and unrest, but address it head on by providing our liberalized or open line to any community. The other thing I would say is if you, you know, one of the key areas we are concerned about is young adults. And if you just look at the mental health of the black population and those young adults, you know, they are, they are far less likely to seek services for mental health than their white counterparts. And there is stigma in their population and we as a community have to work on removing that stigma, making sure they have access to care. There are great, there are great resources. Um, I just did a podcast with Dr. Joy. She runs a podcast that is specific for black adolescents and young adults, uh, females. It's fantastic, but it's all about making sure we open up the conversation and we as CVS Health are invested in ensuring we are opening that conversation to pro provide quality access and resources to our populations. 
Wonderful. Sarah, you want to close it out? Do you have a, how, how are you guys helping folk uh, clients do that? You know, I guess th this is a bit, we could, we could spend another hour on this. Yeah. Just to um, know. Yeah, I agree. Um, what I would say yeah. is, as we close out is one of the bright spots right now is we're talking about this. More and more people are talking about this than ever before, which is amazing. And it's a start. The other thing I would say is as healthcare leaders, we have an obligation to speak about it as well as our own circumstances, because the more we talk about it and come out and, and share our perspectives and our own struggles, the easier it is gonna be for other people to speak to you about it and have a much more open conversation and enable that help. So it is contagious if we talk about it. And so at this point, I would say, just speak up. Amen. Uh, thank you everyone who tuned in to listen to this live. We don't take the hour of your day uh, lightly. It's a privilege to have you uh, take this time. I hope it was an hour well spent. Please give us that feedback by the feedback form. Cara and Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you for the prep. Thank you for all this. This was a great session. I really enjoyed it. I could stay on a lot longer. Uh, this will mark the end of our live recording. Appreciate everyone um, for joining us next week, a week from today, two o'clock, by the way, is the correct time, embedding mental health into primary care. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Great job.